contacts. Yeah. I seem fine. Hey, that's another thing. Another thing that I Okay, well, we're very pleased to have uh, Kevin Leinhoff from UC Berkeley. I met him for the first time at the Bay Area uh, Physics Shindig thing two weeks ago, and he, uh, he uh, foolishly volunteered to come and give a talk. So <laughs> we're very happy to have him, and he's going to tell us about the irreducible axion background. He's coming here from Berkeley, student from Berkeley. Yeah, thank you very much for having me and giving me the opportunity to give a talk here. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about work that I did last year with Nadav Mezgalin, who is a postdoc at UC Berkeley currently, and Nick Rod, who was a postdoc at Berkeley, um, but left for CERN about two years ago. Um, so the main particle I'm going to be talking about today is going to be the axion. And the axion shows up in a variety of different places in theoretical physics. It was first motivated as a solution to the strong CP problem. Um, where I think everyone here is a particle physicist, so maybe I'll skip over some of the details of the strong CP problem, but it's roughly the idea that we constrain the electric dipole moment of the neutron to be a very small number. This sets a very small limit on one of uh, the parameters of the standard model, which, from an effective field theory perspective, has no reason to be small. Um, and the axion solves this by dynamically setting the theta parameter to zero, effectively. Um, Shortly after being proposed as a solution to the strong CP problem, it was proposed as a dark matter candidate. Uh, this is, I think, one of the first few examples of very light dark matter candidates being produced non-thermally. Um, and furthermore, today, now that we haven't seen any dark matter in direct detection and indirect detection experiments, it hints at the potential possibility that dark matter exists within a sector which is completely dark. In other words, it's not charged under any of the standard model gauge groups and only interacts potentially very weakly with the standard model through some weakly interacting mediator. One example would be an axion, and so we can study the axion from the perspective that it might be a mediator rather than just that it's dark matter or just some random particle in the spectrum. Furthermore, it's prevalent in string theories. If you have a string theory, you generically predict axions as well. Um, string theory is a theory of 10 dimensions. We live in three plus one dimensions, therefore six dimensions must be compactified. The way that these compactified dimensions interact with higher dimensional gauge fields um, produce axions as zero modes of these higher dimensional gauge fields in, in the three plus one dimensional uh, theory. Um, and furthermore, if you have any global symmetries which are spontaneously broken within uh, beyond the center of physics, they will produce uh, axions as well. This shows up quite often in flavor symmetries, for example, as flavons or I think they have some other names. But so mainly, it, it solves phenomenological problems, but more so it's even predicted within BSM theories. So it has two roles. Um, and since it has many, uh, it shows up in a variety of different areas of physics, I want to be very specific about which properties I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm going to define my axion through just uh, an effective Lagrangian. It's going to have a mass, ma, and a coupling to photons through this AFF dual term, and a coupling to electrons in the following form. It might also have uh, um, uh, interactions with other particles, but they won't be interesting for my talk because I'm going to be mainly focusing on the interactions with the thermal plasma of the universe at temperatures below 5 mega electron volts. So really the only particles around will be photons, electrons, and neutrinos as well, but they won't be interesting. Um, so these will be the two interactions that we have, and I'm going to mainly focus on this interaction, the photon, the interaction with photons. In the paper, we uh, look at the uh, interaction with photons and electrons and any combination of the two, but uh, I just want to get across the point of the paper, and so this will be enough for my interest. So here I've shown a plot, which I'm going to show many, many times, and uh, these plots I've gotten from Kieran O'Hara's GitHub page. He should actually start costing people, or start making people pay him every time they use the slide. You could make a lot of money. Um, and so on the x-axis, I have the mass of the axion, and here I have the coupling to photons. Typically, for a QCD axion, if the axion solves the strong CP problem and couples to um, GG dual of the standard model, you would be on this line here, depending on which UV completion you choose. Yeah. How, much did, how much did you pay for this figure? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's actually one of the really nice things about these, these GitHub pages, right, with these constraints. It's real. Okay. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd just be digitizing, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. all these different papers would be a mess. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Kirian. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so 
if the axion exists, you get some constraints um, uh, immediately, whether or not it's dark matter or not. And so the constraints which I've plot here all come from astrophysical production. So for example, this constraint uh, with the wiggle line at this point, this comes from the CAST experiment, which is a helioscope type experiment. So all they really do is they point this uh, tube at the sun, they hope an axion is produced within the sun, travels into the tube, and is converted back into a photon through a strong uh, external magnetic field. And then they try to detect this photon. The absence of detection gives you some very strong constraints on this coupling. Uh, but even stronger is the constraints from globular clusters, or equivalently, anomalous stellar cooling. So just as I mentioned that axions are produced within the sun, axions al also produce in all stars, and they are able to escape the stars very easily and uh, take energy with them and cool down the star much more quickly than just a standard model alone. Um, and so how you actually look at this, you don't just look at the sun and measure how fast it cools, because that would be impossible. You can only uh, look at the sun for a short period of time. So what you do is you look at these globular clusters, which have millions of stars in them. Uh, you measure the ratio of different types of stars, and you compare with uh, predictions from uh, theory predictions of uh, uh, stellar cooling, and you can get some very strong constraints. There's also constraints from supernova, and one other one, this is from the uh, solar, uh, sorry, yeah, solar basin uh, paper of Ken, Ken Van Tilburg, mm. um, where he looks at these heavier axions which are produced within the sun and don't have enough kinetic energy to escape the gravitational potential, and they just kind of, uh, I don't know, get caught in the gravitational well of the sun, and you can potentially see their decays. Um, but if you add the additional assumption, and it's an assumption that the axion is all of dark matter, you get very strong constraints from their decays. Um, so that's shown in blue here. You get cosmological constraints, for example, from the CMB, BBN, spectral distortions, um, uh, from the cosmic radiation background, X-rays, so if you, if you point a telescope at the galactic center, you should theoretically see axions decaying into uh, photons if they are all of dark matter. And all of these constraints are extremely strong. Uh, they essentially rule all the reasonable parameter space for Ga gamma gamma, if it is dark matter. Um, and uh, furthermore, there's also uh, these haloscopes, which are essentially equivalent to the helioscopes in principle. They're looking for an axion in dark matter, the dark matter halo, to wander into this magnetic field and, be, um, and interact with the magnetic field and, and be detected. Um, this is really our only chance of going down to the QCD axion line in this region which is predicted for dark matter. That's fine for dark matter um, because like, this is the region where we predict axion dark matter to exist if it is the QCD axion. So there's motivation for going down in this direction here, as opposed to, for example, like here or here. So I should have asked earlier when you were talking about the red stuff, but is where, you know, as kind of as per our conversation earlier, what, where is, uh, where is, um, uh, is, 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 is uh, supernova cooling on this plot? Oh, there, there's, um, there's different types of supernova cooling. Um, but these are all supernova constraints here. Um, so some come from looking at the amount of neutrinos that you'd expect to see. I think supernova 1987A saw how many neutrinos? 17. Like 17. Yeah. 17. But I mean, um, more from the cooling. Yeah, that's a different, yeah, but cooling constraints? Uh, I'm not sure which one is cooling. It's those? Okay, it's only at those super high masses? Okay. Well, it, so it probably goes behind as well. Okay. So some land in the lower mass region, right? Don't know what that. They, what, what are they? All of these? Yeah. These are like 20 different experiments. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. okay. Do you think okay. supernova? It's okay. It's okay. It's, it's yeah. For my own curiosity. But the sensitivity of the neutrino output is is a, is it's sensitive to cooling. Right? Yeah, it's, it is. Cool. And I'm just surprised. I see. Okay. All right. Um, but so the main point of this talk will be focusing on the dark matter decay region. Um, and so the, the main question I want to ask is, what if the axion is not all of dark matter? So you, you can answer this question very simply. If the axion is only 1% of dark matter, these constraints get lifted up by a factor of 10 on GA gamma gamma, simply because uh, the decay rate goes like GA gamma gamma squared. But it would be better if we can say a little bit more stronger of a statement than just assuming some random fractional abundance. 
And so I'm going to try to explain that there exists an irreducible axion background, a background of axion, um, axions which act essentially like dark matter, but are only a subfraction of the total energy density of dark matter, which is extremely hard to get away, uh, to remove by modifying cosmology. Um, in other words, uh, this, this will be the amount of axions which are freezed in. And I will discuss kind of the logic behind this in just a little bit. Um, but before I do that, I just want to mention, uh, well, okay, go over the logic, um, and also mention how these fractional abundances can be constrained. And the first thing I want to point out is that fractional abundance is not an exotic thing. It's very likely that dark matter consists of multiple different species of particles. Um, in the standard model, for example, we have BBN, which occurs, and it gives us many, many different types of particles, um, which are all stable, um, and are, they, they come with exponentially suppressed fractional abundances, but they're still relevant. Um, and <clears throat> the main thing is that if a particle is stable on the time scale of the age of the universe, and it has the ability to be produced at any time in the cosmological history, then it will still be around today. Um, and even if it does decay, for example, like tritrium, uh, which decays into helium-3 at some later point, I think like 10 to the 10 seconds or so, you can still observe this. Um, so for example, CMB occurs around 10 to the, I think, 11 seconds or something like that. Um, or CMB is produced around that time period. So even for uh, a decaying particle, we will still be interested in this situation as well. So I want to describe, define um, a what I mean by fractional abundance, and I will do that in the following way, in order to accommodate situations like tritrium. So if I have a particle chi, which is a subfraction of the total energy density of dark matter, here I've normalized by the entropy to account for the expansion of the universe, um, but it decays at some point, I will define the fractional abundance to be this ratio if chi never decays. Okay, so that's, that's how I'll define it. And then, if I make this definition, the uh, uh, energy density of chi, oh sorry, this is a little low. Um, the ener energy density of chi can be described by F chi times the energy density of dark matter times e to the minus t over tau chi. So the, the e to the minus t over tau chi will account for this um, decay while allowing me to describe F as a constant. This is true as long as the particle chi is non-relativistic and Friesen has completed by the time I'm using this. And I, I haven't talked about Friesen, but the audience seems like I was expecting more graduate students, so um, I'll explain Friesen just a little bit. Um, okay, so then if we do define this fractional abundance in the following way, how can we convert immediately without any, with doing any additional experiments or any additional analysis, how can we convert constraints on dark matter into constraints on this fractionally abundant particle chi? So, Assume uh, the lifetime of this particle is longer than the age of the universe, just for the moment. I'll come back to the situation when this is not true. Then if I have a direct detection constraint on dark matter nucleon interactions, I can immediately get a constraint on my chi nucleon uh, scattered cross-section by multiplying by the fractional abundance. Okay? So, um, yeah, that, that's kind of the main idea. Uh, I would like to draw a plot. Um, need eraser. Um, it should be it should be fine, I think. Uh, oh, thanks. You have a yeah, thank you so much. You, you got chakra. Um, yeah. <laughs> there, there's chakra actually. Oh, okay. Oh, here's more. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Yeah. So, uh, like the the easiest way or example of where this might occur is if you have a mass and a cross section. Uh, so some spin-independent nucleon cross-section for dark matter, which looks like this, for example, at uh, a xenon-type experiment, and you see a, you want to put constraints on a particle with a fractional abundance of 10 to the minus 10, all you do is you lift this constraint or this up by a factor of 10 to the 10, or in general, uh, f chi to the minus 10. Okay? So it's, it's really quite simple. Um, you can do the exact same thing for constraints on decay from indirect detection experiments, and also for dark matter annihilation. 
For dark matter annihilation, though, you get suppressed by f chi squared. So generally speaking, this is not competitive in any way, so I won't be considering this in this talk. But for indirect detection of the Ks, uh, as I will show in a little bit, we can constrain fractional abundances of a trillionth of the total dark matter energy density. Th this is actually quite simple. Um, it's because that we can constrain lifetimes of dark matter to be larger than 10 to the 29 seconds, which is a trillion times longer than the age of the universe. And this immediately, just from this equation here, converts to a constraint on the fractal bonds. But I'll show plots of this as well. Any, any questions about the logic at this point? Okay. So then the last, okay, no, I should next one. Um, so in general, we can put constraints on the mass, the coupling, some sort of coupling, which might show up as a cross-section or a decay rate, and the fractional abundance, kind of in this way. Um, and there's roughly three approaches. We can take the dark matter approach. This is just where we assume chi is dark matter. We can take the agnostic approach and treat f chi as an additional free parameter. Um, and we can also take the calculational approach, where we calculate the specific fractional abundance of the particle, assuming some given cosmology. Um, and in some cases, this is independent of the cosmological history. For example, with dark photons, their dark photons are produced at a specific, um, uh, in the low temperature regime. And so they're roughly independent of cosmology before BBM. Uh, but sometimes they will depend on cosmology. And any constraints you get using the calculational approach for a given cosmology, if it changes with a different cosmology, it's not robust. It's not a strong constraint. And so what I would like to point out is that we can actually get a strong constraint if we use the irreducible abundance of the particle chi. Um, and so the irreducible abundance will be the abundance of the particle chi, assuming that it's only produced from the thermal plasma after the beginning of BBM. So we can constrain the universe to be radiation dominated all the way back to a temperature of about five mega electron volts. But before that, we know nothing about the universe. It could be matter dominated, domain wall dominated, many crazy types of different cosmology. Um, and I will not care about the uh, history of uh, cosmology before BBN whatsoever. I will just assume that the universe is radiation dominated for all temperatures below five mega electron volts, or from the beginning of BBN. So you're saying you only consider production after the BBN, which means uh, you thermal production or non-thermal production. Do you have assumption about that one? So it will be produced from thermal plasma non-thermally. Non-thermally, okay, non-thermally, okay. Yeah. So it won't be freeze out, it'll be mm -hmm. freeze out, which is technically non-thermal. Okay. <clears throat> okay, and then, so using this fractional abundance, any constraints I use, uh, sorry, I obtain using this fractional abundance will be completely robust to modifications of the cosmological history before BBN under two assumptions. And so those assumptions are somewhat mild. Those assumptions are that chi does not decay or annihilate into a dark sector. For an axion, this is... I would say almost trivial, uh, because any interaction should couple like 1 over Fa, which is the same coupling I'm using to constrain this, uh, and I generally assume that it's very long-lived. So this is a mild assumption for axions. For something like sterile neutrinos or a dark photon, this would be a relatively moderate uh, assumption, because uh, a dark photon could you know, obviously decay into a dark sector, disappear completely, not show up in any experiment. Um, and furthermore, uh, I also assume that standard cosmology holds from BBN on. In other words, from when the temp temperature of the universe was 5 mega electron volts till today, basically. Um, and so this one, this step takes a little bit of thinking, um, because we don't have any observables, uh, cosmological observables, from BBN to CMB. Uh, we have N effective, and N effective can constrain decays which occur between BBN and the CMB, but, um, but we don't really have any direct observables of uh, this period of time in the cosmological history. It, it, uh, well, there's upper limits on um, energy injection, right, which have spectral distortions. Oh, great, yeah. So, yeah, so spectral distortions, exactly right. So spectral distortions can extend um, further back in time. That's exactly right, yeah. And so I'll actually look at those constraints as well. But that's uh, that's more of a constraint. Yeah, that's it's, it's exactly. After BBN. Yeah, um, but I think what I mean is that's a constraint on new fit. Okay, yeah, no, you're exactly right. Um, but so I think the point is that it's generally very hard to modify cosmology in these time periods and still be consistent with all the observations we have today. So I'm comfortable with this assumption. 
Okay, so just to summarize the logic before I get into um, axions, the, the statements that I made is that subcomponents are well motivated and interesting in their own right, uh, as well as just studying dark matter. Dark matter searches can constrain these subcomponents directly without any additional analysis or um, experiments. You can just use the results which are already given. And finally, uh, there exists an irreducible abundance which can be used to obtain robust constraints, robust under any modifications to cosmology before PBI. Okay. Any questions or concerns about the logic? Yeah. I mean, can you remind me what is PBI? Oh, BBN is Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. It's when the light elements, uh, for example, hydrogen, helium, deuterium, and uh, others are formed. Okay. Um, so I showed a plot of it just a while back. But yeah, it's just the light elements, which we see in the universe today. Okay. Um, so now I want to apply this logic to axioms. Um, so the rough idea is first I have to calculate the irreducible fractional abundance of axions, and then um, I'm going to apply... Oh, I didn't start my clock. Is there a clock in here? No. No? Okay. <laughs> um, and then I'm going to uh, apply the constraints that I have from dark matter onto this irreducible fractional abundance. Okay. How many slides do you have in total? Oh, I don't know. You don't know? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. We can continue. Go on. Okay. Um, so first off, how are the axions produced? So as I said before, I'm going to assume uh, all the axions that I'm looking at, the irreducible fractional abundance, is produced uh, Starts, the freezing process begins at a temperature of 5 mega electron volts. Um, and so then I have to get, answer the question, what is freezing? Because I don't assume everyone here is a cosmologist or knows what freezing is by the back of their hand. Um, and it's not a textbook, so it's not textbook material. So freezing is the process where particles uh, are created from the primordial plasma of the universe without ever being in thermal equilibrium with it. That's the rough idea. Sometimes people will add on additional statements like freezing is when particles are slowly built up over a long period of time. But when they say this, they're actually talking about a specific case. So all I mean is that the standard model and the particle chi are not in thermal equilibrium, but the forward process where the standard model particles produce the particle chi is turned on. So the particles chi will be produced in this way. Um, so roughly, uh, freezing can be classified into two different classes. There's actually much more um, classes, and people have tried to classify all the different possibilities, but uh, the way that I think about it is the following. So if I plot the yield, which is just the number density over the entropy and density to account for the uh, expansion of the universe as a function of time, there is IR freezing, infrared freezing, which is slowly built up over a period of time, but then cut off by some kinetic or chemical cutoff. In other words, uh, if there's not enough energy in the thermal plasma to produce these particles anymore, it will be cut off as the temperature cools down. Or if there's not enough particles to produce them, the same thing occurs. So that's IR freezing. There's also UV freezing. UV freezing is when the freezing process is sensitive only to the highest energy physics that it is in contact with. So this would be at the beginning of reheating. Reheating, for me, will be just um, the beginning of the radiation-dominated era. So for me, uh, 5 mega electron volts. Okay. In general, when people talk about reheating, they usually mean when some period of matter domination ends as the particles decay. But I will only treat it as the highest temperatures, which basically just means 5 megaelectron volts. Okay, so those are the two types of freezing. And just to be a little bit more quantitative, I, I've decided to not go through the full calculation because I think the physics can be completely encapsulated in just um, kind of dimensional analysis, basically. Uh, the Boltzmann equation, which determines the number density of axions, is given by the following. Um, so the number density changes by the expansion of the universe. Um, and it increases if the axion is produced, so this is just the production rate, and it decreases if the axions decay or get destroyed. So, uh, as I just said, that's the axion production and destruction. And for freezing, we will assume that the axion destruction rate is significantly smaller than the production rate. If they're equal, that's the definition of thermal equilibrium, detailed balance. Um, so, okay, we'll assume that one is zero. And then if I define the yield, as I did before, if Na, the number density over the entropy density, um, I can simplify this equation pretty significantly to dya d log t uh, is equal to minus gamma over h. So gamma has dimensions of inverse mass, sorry, uh, of inverse time or mass. Uh, h has units of mass, so this is dimensionless, this is dimensionless, and this is in log temperature space. 
So if I integrate this over time, I get that my freeze in abundance is roughly uh, equivalent to the maximum value of gamma over H. So whatever temperature maximizes this value, I calculate this at that value, and this is roughly correct within order one coefficients. Um, and if you want to see the order one coefficients, I have those slides, but it's not fun, and I don't think anyone really cares to see a bunch of cross sections. Um, but so let me go over this with a little bit of dimensional analysis just to give the idea. So if I'm looking at this process at a temperature of 5 mega electron volts, such that the electrons and positrons can be treated roughly as massless, and the axion and photon are lighter, sorry, well, the photon is light, well, okay, and the axion is light, then there's only one coupling which has dimensions, that's Ga gamma gamma. So Ga gamma gamma has dimensions of mass to the minus 1, and so just from dimensional analysis, my production rate looks like the following. There's also an alpha here coming from this coupling, but I've chosen to ignore that. Um, therefore, gamma over H looks like this, and so it's linear with T, and so if I plot gamma over H as a function of time, uh, as a function of temperature, it's going to look like this. And again, I only need to calculate this at the maximum possible value to calculate my freeze in abundance. So if this were to extend on for larger temperatures, it would eventually reach 1. If gamma over H reaches 1, that means that we actually have freeze out. It reaches thermal equilibrium, which means that it's not freezing, it's going to be freeze out. So this has to be cut off at some point, and that will be cut off at T reheat. Um, so this actually gives me a constraint. It, it gives me a constraint that this interaction rate at reheating has to be smaller than the Hubble rate. Um, uh, it turns out that constraint is extremely weak. It's like G gamma gamma is 10 to the minus 7 or larger. So I won't consider that. Um, and so this will be the freeze in abundance. And the one other feature here is that for low temperatures, this eventually will cut off as well. Once the temperatures get below the axion mass, this production rate will be Boltzmann suppressed. Okay? In particular, if I, if I take my axion mass and I increase it, eventually I will get no production. So um, I roughly require that my axion mass must be lighter than the reheating temperature, or in other words, 5 mega electron volts. We'll see we can extend that a little bit further, but that's roughly the truth. Um, so as an example of IR freezing, as opposed to the previous process, which was an example of UV freezing, uh, let's consider the process of inverse decay. So when two photons combine to form an axion. Naively, we only have one coupling, which is G a gamma gamma, and so we'd expect, by dimensional analysis, the exact same um, production rate. But that's maybe something wrong with this one. I, I, yeah. I would suspect that it's not usually wrong. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, otherwise, I'm hinting at something. Yeah. Like <laughs> because that would be a delta function, something we factored, right? So actually, the delta function is not important because this is a thermal process. So we're, we're integrating over S. But that didn't mean A should be on shell? Yes, but uh, because it's a, like, so, right, when you do sigma V in uh -huh. expectation mode, like the thermal uh, uh -huh. uh, cross section, right, you have to integrate over energy. And so okay, okay, you, okay, you got it. That, okay, probably that doesn't matter. Let's go. Yeah. Um, okay, but so this is actually wrong. And the reason it's wrong is because these photons are actually not massless. In the thermal plasma, the photons are interacting with the charged particles, and they get an effective mass. This is exactly this, you know, yeah, okay, that's okay. They get an effective mass. Um, the same thing happens with light in materials as well, right? They get an effective mass. So what happens is that this effective mass will look something like the following. It will be E times T over 3, which is roughly temperature over 10. Um, and if the photons are heavier, uh, are too heavy to produce this axion on shell, then you, the process will never happen, um, just because it can't conserve energy. So the process will actually be zero for high temperatures. And so if I plot this, uh, the same plot as before, gamma over H is a function of temperature, it'll look something like the following. So the process does not get turned on at T reheat. It does not get turned on until the temperature is roughly of the order of the axion mass. Um, and at which point it will reach its maximum soon after and then slowly decay back down. Um, and so this is an example of IR freezing because it depends on the uh, low energy physics, not necessarily the high energy physics, and I, if I increase the reheat, it's completely insensitive to this, unless the axion mass is very heavy. 
But if I move this whole blob to the right, it will, but in general, it won't. Uh, say, what if gamma gamma to a a parallel deduction? It may be not important. Sorry, the know. gamma gamma to two a. The power production oh. of x and field. Well, that won't happen, right? Because that'd be suppressed by g gamma gamma to so the, the fourth. So the probably too too small, I think. Yeah. Okay. So that'll be probably uh, quite a bit. It's better, yeah, better off just adding an, like an electron or something. Right? Mm -hmm. You can certainly do that. Yeah, like like in. Yeah, like you had before. This one. Yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So let's actually look at the whole thing now. I won't go through the entire calculation, but there's three processes. Um, it turns out this process, well, okay, I'll just show you the results, but I'm going to focus mainly on the coupling to photons. Okay. Uh, I'll show you the process for the coupling to electrons later. Um, but so if I plot, so again, this is the same plot I had before, g gamma gamma versus the mass, and I've shown the, uh, where the mass is equal to the reading temperature, which I picked to be 5 mega electron volts. And here I've plotted the fractional abundance, and so what we see is that if I increase g gamma gamma, the abundance increases as it should. If the interaction gets stronger, I produce more axions. Uh, furthermore, if I have a very heavy axion, then it gets Boltzmann suppressed, and I get no abundance, essentially. So uh, anything above roughly 10 to the 5 uh, keV will not show up. It will never be produced in this irreducible axion background. <clears throat> um, so this is the amount from photon conversion. From inverse decay, I actually get a slightly different behavior. This is because it's not sensitive to T reheat, but it, it has an extra dependence on MA, so it's proportional to MA. Um, and so it has a different slope here, and it also is dominant at large MA. Uh, this is actually just because it has one less coupling of alpha, basically. Um, and finally, there's this fermion annihilation process, which is significantly subdominant to the, uh, uh, the photon conversion process. And the reason why is that the photon conversion process actually has an infrared divergence. So if I go back to this uh, plot, um, this photon, if it's completely massless, and everything's massless here, I have an infrared divergence. Uh, and it's only cut off by the fact that the photon actually has a thermal mass. So this gets an enhancement of roughly by a factor of 10. Um, so this is the fractional abundance that I will be using. OK, so now we can apply our astrophysical constraints. And I'd like to do first an example, just an example. So here. I have the exact same fractional abundance plotted um, here in blue. So this is a fractional abundance of 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 10, and 10 to the minus 15, as well as the constraints um, which we already have from stellar cooling and such. Um, and so if we use the benchmark constraint that we constrain the lifetime of dark matter to be larger than 10 to the 28 seconds, and we assume it's mass independent, which it isn't, but we're just picking a specific value, then that gives us a constraint on the lifetime of the axion, which is dependent on Fa, the fractional abundance, which I've just calculated and shown in blue. And the constraint we get is shown in orange. And so this would be a dream. Like, I would love this. Um, it turns out this is not the full constraint. And the reason why is because we only see x, like these are x-rays from looking at the galactic center, for example. And we only see x-rays today, roughly. Um, and so we must require that the axions have a lifetime which is larger than roughly the age of the universe. So that cuts off our constraints from above. So we lose that a little bit, but it's still pretty good. Um, and if I do the full analysis with all the different experiments, experimental results looking for dark matter, I get the following constraints. So th this is the constraint shown on this plot, but I've separated it into the different uh, experiments here. So we have X and Newton, New Star, and Interval, which are all different types of telescopes looking for X-rays. Um, <coughs> but, but this is the rough idea. This is um, the main idea. Of what I'm so you're, the, 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 the other constraints you're showing there are not assuming that, uh, obviously not there are the constraints that we would have, not assuming that the axion is, is dark matter. They don't assume anything about cosmology. But you're saying with some super minimum, minimal uh, assumptions about cosmology, you can actually put some cosmology. It's fair to put cosmology constraints exactly on the right. Plot, right? Exactly right. Yeah. So these are astrophysical production constraints. Right. So this is horizontal branch stars, which, in other words, is stellar cooling. Mm -hmm. um, this is the basin, so the axions which are produced in this by the sun and just rotate around, and you detect by their decays. Mm -hmm. 
um, and uh, supernova. Um, and the blue constraints, which I've shown here, are actually stronger than this constraint, as they must be, because they're assuming a fractional abundance of one, right? Um, but these constraints are robust under very mild assumptions about cosmology. Right. That's, that's the main idea. Okay, so um, instead of going through all the different constraints that I'm going to be using, I just want to give a rough idea. I think this is a very general principle of how you can look for decaying dark matter um, with cosmology. And so the main point is that we can observe the effect of their decays uh, using different probes, different cosmological probes, depending on when they decay. And so if they have a lifetime which is larger than the age of the universe, the best place to look for axions is through their decays in the galactic center. Um, or in dwarf spiral galaxies if you're worried about background or other things, but I won't go into that too much detail. But this is the rough idea. Um, and the main next reason, the reason why x-rays are strong is because we can look at the galactic center which has a very high d factor. The abundance of dark matter there is very large and therefore axion. Um, and the uh, signal is monochromatic, so it's very easy to see. So there's no, not much background, in other words. Um, if we want to look at particles which decay slightly earlier in the cosmological history, we can potentially gain by looking at the, uh, the cosmic radiation background. So this is the x-rays, or light that we see from the axions which decay in the diffuse uh, background of axions. In other words, the axions which isn't localized in any particular source, like the galactic center, but just everywhere in the galaxy. And the reason why this is sometimes stronger is we can see them decay much earlier. In other words, very large redshift. So the constraint looks something like this. So depending on when they decay, they'll have a different energy, uh, which is just redshifted. Uh, but this also is what kills the constraints as well, because once they get redshifted too far, the abundance decreases and the signal goes down. Um, so this, this helps a little bit, but it, it's not infinitely helpful, as we might hope. Um, we also get constraints from CMB anisotropies. So if, if the particles are decaying late, shortly after the production of the CMB, the last scattering surface, um, then they can modify the CMB anisotropy basically by just injecting energy into the uh, thermal plasma during the process that the uh, photons decouple. And it can change the, the anisotropies. Um, so that was done by a paper by Slater and Wu. This band here just corresponds to different models. Like they look at several different models, so we pick the most conservative constraint out of this. Um, and further, as you mentioned before, we can go back even further in time before the production of the CMB by looking at spectral distortions. And so this is basically the statement that the black body spectrum, the extremely uh, precise black body spectrum that we observe in the CMB, can be potentially modified if there are non equilibrium processes occurring during the formation of the CMB. Um, in other words, decaying particles would mess this up a little bit. Um, I'll try to go over the last two quickly, because uh, I want to get to the results. But we can also look at constraints on BBN. As I was mentioned before, these light elements are produced around the temperature of a mega electron volt. And if we have particles which are decaying, they can hit these particles and disturb them or destroy them, basically. And this would modify the uh, uh, abundance of light elements that we see today. And furthermore, there's uh, delta N effective constraints, um, which we can use. And that will give us uh, additional constraints. So delta N effective is just the effective number of neutrino species that we see in the radiation path. And we can measure this both at CMB and BBN. And so any decays which occur between that time can potentially modify N effective, and we could observe that. Um, OK. So here's the result. So I have x-rays, the cosmic radiation background, CMBs, and spectral distortions here. And BBN is here. Someone actually did BBN for a low reheating scenario, so we put that in gray. I think we were actually the first people to do spectral distortions, so I'm not sure why that's in gray. Um, but, but so this is the result. And the main point to see here is that we can get extremely uh, uh, strong constraints, constraints down to a fractional abundance of smaller than 10 to the minus 10 and improve upon these constraints by roughly, I don't know, four or five orders of magnitude relative to the stellar cooling constraints. And if you use this, which maybe isn't the best point of measurement because we're missing a little bit of the region, you can get like 10 to the minus, uh, 10 to the 10 stronger or so. Um, okay. 
But so then the question is, how can you, how else can you use these irreducible axion backgrounds? Oh, shit, sorry. I also wanted to point this out. This just shows the decay rate. So here's tau is equal to 10 to the 17, which is the age of the universe. That explains why you can see the x-rays here. This is 10 to the 13, which is shortly after the CMB was produced. And then this is 10 to the 5, which is roughly during BBM. So it's kind of the idea there. Okay. But so then how can you generalize this to other models? So as I mentioned before, we also have production through the coupling to electrons, uh, these interactions over here. And so if we plot those constraints, we get something like the following. So we get X-ray CMB and spectral distortion constraints just as before. Um, the main issue here is that for masses larger than a mega electron volt, you can have decays into an electron-positron pair. And so this will kill the constraints because it increases uh, the decay rate significantly. Um, this decay to photons can still occur, but it occurs only through a one-loop process, so it's, it's quite slow. Um, same as the x-rays. The x-rays also occur through this one-loop process. Um, but so again, we can get very strong constraints on the coupling to electrons. Uh, furthermore, I, I think I've learned to appreciate this plot a little bit more over time. But in general, for axions which su which su no, with such small couplings, we expect there to be some sort of misalignment mechanism occurring post-inflation, like a post-inflationary axion. Um, and so if it has an order one misalignment angle, you get much stronger constraints. And it's only if you fine-tune this misalignment angle to zero that you can ignore the production from misalignment. Sorry, what was misalignment? So um, the axion is a scalar field, and uh, during the cosmological history, the scalar field, the value of the scalar field, will get pinned to some random point. Uh, a a problem. <laughs> um, and uh, because of Hubble friction, it will not move. The equations of motion says, well, I can write down the equations of motion. Um, the equations of motion look like a double dot plus 3ha uh, dot. Uh, plus ma squared a is equal to zero. Mm -hmm. And so if Hubble is much larger than ma, which should be the case during inflation, then the solution to this equation is a is equal to zero. The scalar field value is stuck at a single value. Um, and once uh, QCD confines, the axion gets a potential. So uh, the potential will look something like this. And if the axion field is here, it will get boosted up to this point, and then once Hubble decreases below MA, the axion field will begin to oscillate. These oscillations will redshift essentially like matter, and this is the misalignment mechanism. It's how axions are produced non-thermally. And what does this theta not create? So theta not is, so if this is the axion field, uh, the axion shows up, connecting to GG dual usually, um, and so it's an angular parameter, and so this value, this initial displacement of the axion field, is theta times Fa, where Fa is the decay constant of the axion. So it essentially just corresponds to the value, the displacement of the axion relative to the minimum. But in general, there's no reason why this should be small. That's the main point. Hey, can, I, can I ask about that? So I'm not, uh, I don't, I don't, I'm not up on the, the whole axion dark matter uh, uh, craze. So, uh, if, uh, is it generally assumed that that the generic initial condition is theta naught is of order one? Is generally, that, yeah. General? And and is it is it would it be interesting if there was a mechanism for theta naught to be small? Like there's you know, I have some small parameter, some approximate symmetry or something that guarantees that theta naught is small? In general, that will be impossible because the... I think it's not, I think it's very possible. That's what I'm asking. So okay. let's not talk about whether it's possible or not. Okay. I just want to know, would that be interesting? If it were, if there was a way, if there was, you know, like there are lots of things that are small that the baryon to uh, photon ratio is small, right? But, but so theta... So th like this that. is not the theta parameter of connecting to uh, GG dual. I understand that. Okay. This is the axion misalignment angle. Which is produced dynamically through quantum I fluctuations. I understand that. But I still, I'm still saying that uh, uh, there might be a, 
Maybe not. But I'm just asking, is it, would it be interesting if there was a mechanism to make it small? It would be very interesting. I'd love to hear it. Okay. Well, I'm not sure it's possible. Okay. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just, okay. Okay, but it would be very interesting. In fact, um, a lot of times we expect FA, the decay constant, to be very large. In other words, GA gamma gamma to be very small. Uh, for example, we would expect in string theory that FA is at, at the string scale. Or in the string activeverse, we would expect it to be around the gut scale. Um, but this is constrained with an order one misalignment angle. So if you believe in these theories and you believe in axion dark matter, then you believe in fine tuning. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I probably haven't thought about it enough. Maybe I'm being superficial, but it seems to me it might be possible. But let's, let's go on. Okay. Um, so if I kept this small, then you can have a much higher FA, right? That's yeah. Okay. Which is potentially. I, I, I mean, you know, it may, I, I, like I said, I haven't thought about it enough, so I'm probably I'm just being very, very naive. But I'll, I'll think about it. Okay. No, I don't think so. I think that would be a very interesting talk question. About, well, no, whether it's possible, I mean, yeah. I mean it might be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, but if we do assume an order one misalignment angle, we actually get these kind of strange constraints. But there's a reason why they're strange. Um, is that the axion abundance from misalignment does not depend on MA if it's produced during an early matter domination era, which is actually what we're assuming when we make this plot. I should, I should write that assumption. But here is the first place where I'm actually assuming something about cosmology beforehand. I'm assuming this early matter domination before we even. If it's radiation dominated, these constraints get stronger. So it's kind of a, still a mild assumption, but it does assume a little bit of uh, post-reheating cosmology, uh, pre-reheating cosmology. But these constraints can essentially uh, rule out an entire mass range, basically. So it's potentially interesting. When, you know, when you were thinking about these irreducible, when you mentioned these irreducible backgrounds, in the back of my head, I thought that the kind of cosmology, if you would ask, well, what kind of cosmology could I imagine would actually saturate these minimal constraints? Mm -hmm. Well, there's a, a very natural possibility is that, uh, you know, reheating is just at a low temperature. So basically what you had before 5 MeV was inflation, right? I mean, that to me sounded like, I mean, that could be, that's at least a minimal cosmology that you could uh, have. Yeah, that's exactly right. Right? Um, but so, so then, but then, but then this, this constraint here would be out the window, or? Well, so this assumes early matter domination, exactly. so it assumes that exact same scenario. Oh, um, you're saying if, the, if you had slow reheating, you could think of that as a phase of early matter domination? Yeah, exactly. And so this is the first slide which I've shown which assumes anything whatsoever about the universe okay. before 5 mega yeah. volts. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it loses out on that irreducibility part because, for example, it's not irreducible. I can tune theta to be zero and reduce it. Um, but it's interesting, I think, nevertheless, because in, in general, this is a parameter which you have no reason to fine-tune to zero. Um, but it should be there, in other words. But you can always reduce it, so these constraints are not robust anymore. So then finally, the last thing I wanted to talk about um, is sterile neutrinos. So this is, this is the last application which I'm going to show. I'm not going to go through all the details, because the details are almost exactly the same as the axion case. Um, but what I'm going to assume is that there exists a sterile neutrino, which uh, uh, interacts with the electron neutrino through mixing. And it's produced exactly the same way through a freezing process. And so the freezing process is slightly complicated. It's not really important, but it has a couple different pieces. It has the uh, inverse decay, it has the scattering, and it has um, the, the uh, donaldson Widrow mechanism, basically, is this last piece. And this was calculated for these heavy, they call it heavy neutral leptons, or essentially sterile neutrinos, in the paper in 20, 2008. So we didn't really have to do any new physics there. Um, and the constraints are obtained from the decay into photons, the radiative decay through a one-loop process into photons. However, what's different than the axion case is that the mechanism for detection is different than the process which determines the lifetime of the sterile neutrinos. So the process which determines the lifetime of the neutrinos will be do dominated by this tree-level process, this tree-level decay into three neutrinos, and possibly, if the sterile neutrino is lighter than a mega electron volt, into a positron electron pair, um, but we can do everything exactly the same. We just have to treat the decay rate uh, different than the rate to produce a signal. Um, and we get the following constraints, which are very competitive in regards to the terrestrial experiments, which are 
So can I just ask, I mean, the decayed neutrinos, wouldn't that be relevant for BDN constraints at least? May not be for, enough, obviously not for observing photons, but doesn't that also disrupt BDN if I inject a bunch of... It should disrupt it significantly. Yeah. yeah. So that, is that taken into account in your analysis? I don't think so, actually. Okay. That's an important point. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, so I, I should look into that. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, so, so I actually don't have BBN constraints on here, <laughs> which okay. is something I should. Um, but I have constraints on overclosure, X-ray, CMB, and spectral distortions, just like uh, for the Axion case, and comparing it with terrestrial experiments, which are essentially the same um, in regards to the astrophysical production constraints, constraints which are completely independent of cosmology, as well as supernova constraints, which are constraints on the production. Um, we get very strong constraints, several orders of magnitude stronger than uh, any other experiments. And so there was actually an experiment uh, similar to the one that you were talking about today, where you have the optical tweezers which hold a nanoparticle, and then you look for the decay into sterile neutrinos. Uh, their constraints look something like that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty strong compared to any other uh, type of experiment. Okay, so, so that's all I have to say today. And I just wanted to mention that I have a couple of other uh, projects in, in the works, um, which I'd be very interested to talk to with anyone here. Uh, I'm interested in the Axiverse, in particular in regards to SUN Super Yang Mills domain walls, how domain walls can modify the abundance of axion dark matter, and po potentially point to new regions of parameter space, which might be interesting. Uh, I'm also interested in primordial black hole production with SUSY axions, uh, observing light BSM particles with muon decay, or through muon decay, and finally, axion dark matter in the mirror world. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. More questions for Kevin? So, so you call my interest with muon decay, why, why muon specifically? Um, so, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's a really good question. So, Muons because they're building experiments. Um, so there's lots of muon decay experiments. One possible uh, experiment is mu3e. So uh, I think it's just called like this. And so if you have a muon uh, which decays through a dark photon, for example, as one particular example, which then eventually decays into a positron electron pair. And so here's the mu, uh, mu, and then the muon eventually decays. Uh, into new mu uh, and new, let me get this right, E, something like this, you can potentially um, see this dark photon. But so it has nothing to do with this project, <laughs> so maybe, uh, but I'd love to talk about it after. Uh, sure. But yeah, that's a new idea. Yeah? Well, I'll defer if there's any questions on this, but I'm, I'm interested in the axion dark matter in the mirror world and what, what, what you're doing there. And I'm not going to have time to talk to you later. So, um, But if there's anything... Please, go ahead. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, so are you familiar with the mirror world models? Um, I mean, a little bit. Okay, so, so the rough idea is, actually, we were talking about this before, is that there's a couple of um, interesting ideas of how you can possibly have heavy axion uh, a heavy axion, uh, which still solves a strong CP problem. In other words, a heavy QCD axion. Okay. And so one way that you can do this is you can have two confining uh, sectors, an SU3, uh, like SU3 color, and an SU3 prime, for example, with a Z2 symmetry which relates the two. Okay. Uh, so therefore, the theta parameters would be roughly the same, and so if you minimize one potential, you minimize the other um, with the same axion value. And in this way, if the, if the axion couples to the other confining gauge sector, which has a sh higher confinement scale, and the mass goes like the confinement scale squared over Fa, the axion becomes heavier. In the mirror world, which is, uh, I, I don't think Lawrence was the first person to come up with, but he's been advocating mirror world and left-right symmetric models for a while now, um, you can be very predictive um, about the exact axion mass um, and point to a specific region of parameter space, which is right next to the X-ray constraints, um, which might be interesting to observe. Okay. So that's kind of the main idea of that. Okay. Thanks.
Well, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah, let's thank Kevin again. And hope, uh, <laughs> welcome anyone who wants you to stick around and talk more with Kevin with the recording term.